Good evening. It is with great pleasure that we are joined this evening by Mr. Charles Johnson, by Dr. Matthew Duchatel, and Ambassador Joanne Adamson, who's behind me on Skype right now. The panel is the global nuclear dilemma, power, stability, and proliferation. We are missing Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins because of the terrible weather, and I'm thankful for her for making a really good effort to come here. My name is Arthur Bhargava, and I'm a member of this year's Epic Colloquium. I'm a first year student from India, and I'm planning to major in international relations with a focus in international security. For our discussion, we are presented with a very topical motion. Not only in context of the Korean Peninsula, but also in fundamentally understanding the role that nuclear weapons play in creating a balance of power in any, in any geostrategic situation. From the Middle East to South Asia to East Asia, the nuclear question is fueling debate. Is the nuclear non-proliferation still viable? Are sanctions effective? What is the impact on states that have voluntarily given up nuclear weapons? And what threats do rogue nations pose from terrorism to sharing technology of nuclear weapons? The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists says the doomsday clock, an analogy for the threat of the global nuclear war is as close to midnight as it was in 1953 at the height of the nuclear tension in the Cold War. So let us examine whether it is with fire and fury or with strategic strangulation and diplomatic fervor that we can make a safer world. For the purpose of this panel, each panelist has been asked to give opening remarks for 12 minutes. After that, at 10 minutes, the timer will turn yellow, and at 12, the timer will turn red. Following that, we will open the panel to discussion among our speakers, and then open to the audience for a question and answer period. We have a distinguished group of panelists today. I will give a brief introduction about some of the work they have done in context of our panel. You all have their bios in your programs, so I will try to make this really brief. Our first panelist is Ambassador Joanne Adamson. Ambassador Adamson has been the deputy head of the European Union delegation to the United Nations in New York since 1st of September 2016. In addition, in addition to being the UK's permanent representative to the Conference of Disarmament from 2011 to 2013, she was also the UK's chief negotiator at the UN's Armed Strait Treaty Diplomatic Conference in 2012 and 2013. Our second panelist is Dr. Matthew Duchatel. Matthew Duchatel is a senior policy fellow and the deputy director of the Asia and China program at the European Council of Foreign Relations. Based in the Paris office of the ECFR, he works on Asian security with a focus on maritime affairs, the Korean Peninsula, China's foreign policy, and EU-China relations. Our last panelist is Mr. Charles Johnson. Mr. Johnson is the director of the nuclear programs for the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, IPPNW. He's a representative of IPPNW on the International Steering Group of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, winner of the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize and the lead NGO in support of the United States Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Again, I thank all of you for making time for our panel today. Without further ado, I would request Mr. Charles Johnson to give his opening remarks. Is this live? Yes. Thank you very much, Atre, That's a, for your uh, good introduction. Uh, I'm Charles Johnson. I am the Director of Nuclear Programs for International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, uh, based here in Boston. Uh, we have 63 uh, affiliate groups throughout the world. Um, I'll focus my the opening comments on the concerns we have at IPPNW as a founding member of the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons, um, ICANN, about the enormous danger we face in continuing to rely upon deterrence as protection from the use of nuclear weapons and the catastrophic consequences that would ensue if it fails. We believe that focusing on huma the humanitarian consequences of the use of nuclear weapons and banning and stigmatizing nuclear weapons in the same way 
as has been done with other inherently illegal and immoral weapons, such as chemical weapons, biological weapons, landmines, and cluster munitions, puts their alleged utility in the proper perspective. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, when it is entered into force, will put pressure on all nations, and especially those that possess nuclear weapons, to use existing treaty mechanisms and new and bilateral, uh, new bilateral or multilateral treaty arrangements to reach the goal of nuclear weapons abolition that has been part of the UN framework from its founding and the aspiration of many world leaders since the dawn of the nuclear age. IPPNW was founded uh, first by, by uh, a group in the United States called Physicians for Social Responsibility. Uh, a group of doctors, uh, Dr. David Nathan, H. Jack Geiger, Vic Seidel, and Bernard Laun, uh, associated with the Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Public Health, published um, the medical consequences of thermal nuclear war in the New England Journal of Medicine in May of 1962. This was the first description of what uh, could be expected in, uh, in a, a full-scale thermal nuclear war and was part of the discussion that occurred during that period of time in the height of the Cold War. We also participated with a network of dentists throughout the United States in what was known as the Tooth Fairy Project, collecting baby teeth from strontium, of, uh, for looking for strontium-90 which would indicate uh, uh, contamination from nuclear weapons testing, which led to the limited test ban treaty between the United States and the Soviet Union, signed by Kennedy and Khrushchev in 1963, that banned above ground nuclear testing. PSR faded away over time, got involved in a variety of social issues, but was revived in the late 1970s, again in Boston, by a group of younger physicians around nuclear power issues initially, but became a nationwide group under leadership of an Australian physician, uh, Helen Caldicott, Dr. Helen Caldicott, when uh, Ronald Reagan became president, and uh, PSR was an uh, important part of the nuclear weapons freeze movement in the United States, presenting the medical consequences of nuclear war to medical and public groups throughout the country in response to active nuclear war planning by the Reagan administration. In 1981, Dr. Lown and some of his PSR colleagues formed the international organization, IPPNW, with international colleagues, including Dr. Yevgeny Chasov from the Soviet Union. Lown and Chasov served as co-presidents of the organization. And in a number of other countries around the world, uh, it, the major part of the purpose was to increase the exchange and dialogue between adversarial nuclear weapon states. Uh, the basic principle that was espoused was that the cure for nuclear war can only be prevention and that nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. These words were quoted by Reagan and Gorbachev in their historic agreements in Reykjavik in October 1986, signaling the beginning of the end of the Cold War. PSR and IPPNW worked with early researchers, including Carl Sagan into the potential effects of large-scale nuclear attack on the world climate, the nuclear winter effect that you may have heard of, which was estimated to have the potential to extinguish human life on the planet in a full-scale nuclear attack between the U.S. and the Soviet Union due to the large amount of particles released in the atmosphere and years of crop failure that would follow. Um, and in 1985, IPPNW received the Nobel Peace Prize our organizations continued to advocate nu nuclear abolition ever since, and as I said earlier, we now have uh, 63 affiliates uh, in, uh, in uh, 63 countries. Uh, now, fast forward, the end of the Cold War. People forgot that nuclear weapons was an issue, um, unfortunately, uh, because there were so many other issues to focus on. But 10 years ago, uh, when there seemed to be the uh, it seemed that the progress among nuclear weapon states and arms control treaties and new states uh, was, was flagging and new states were moving toward developing uh, nuclear weapons capabilities. The movement and the movement of for, toward nuclear abolition appeared to be stagnating. IPPNW affiliates in Australia and Malaysia proposed that a new treaty be introduced through the United Nations banning the possession, use, or threat to use nuclear weapons based on their humanitarian effects. 
following the lead shown by treaties banning chemical and biological weapons and landmines and cluster munitions. IPPNW sought out partner groups, eventually the 10 current members of the International Steering Group, and constituted a new group, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Arguments for treating nuclear weapons like other banned methods of warfare are obvious, um, but have to be, but have been explained in, uh, in detail in the treaty, including uh, the immense destruction uh, from nuclear weapons use that would indiscriminately kill non-combatants through blast, fire, and radiation. The, in, the vulnerability of women at twice the rate of men and children at four times the rate of adults to suffer medical consequences from radiation exposure, including cancers, immune deficiencies, and genetic damage. And the potential, even in a limited war, such as between India and Pakistan, as established by researchers led by Dr. Alan Roback and others in 2012, could create a dust cloud that would cool the planet enough to cause crop failures throughout the globe and put up to two billion people with a B, the majority of them non-combatants, obvi combatants, obviously, at risk of starvation. Momentum has built for the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons as member states began to indicate support for it and additional non-governmental organizations joined the effort to get it introduced at the UN. ICANN now has over 400 partner organizations. Since our founding, we've worked to build a powerful global groundswell of public support for abolition of nuclear weapons by engaging a diverse range of groups and working alongside the Red Cross, Red Crescent, World Medical Association, and like-minded governments, we have helped reshape the debate on nuclear weapons and generate momentum toward elimination. Years of laborious work through the UN processes with the active opposition of the nuclear weapons states who encouraged their allies to boycott the discussions still resulted in the passage of the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons at the United Nations in New York on July 7, 2017 by a vote of 122 to one opposed and one abstention. ICANN was awarded the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize for our work to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and our groundbreaking efforts to achieve a treaty-based prohibition of such weapons. Throughout the negotiating process, ICANN worked alongside governments to achieve the strongest and most effective treaty possible. Around two-thirds of the world's nations voted in favor of adopting the agreement. Our focus now is on persuading nations to sign and ratify it, and then to work for its full implementation. When 50 countries have officially signed and ratified the treaty, it will go into force worldwide. So far, 56 have signed and five have ratified, but we understand that Kazakhstan will be signing and ratifying, so those numbers will be 57 and six by next week. We hope to have this finished within the next two years and the difficult work of pressuring the nuclear weapon states and their military allies to seriously work toward complete disarmament. Nuclear weapon states take the ban treaty much more seriously than they want to admit. Otherwise, why oppose it if it has no meaning? They realize that it undermines the very legal and moral basis of their perceived right to possess and threaten to use nuclear weapons. An argument that has been used is that the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty undermines the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, but what has actually been undermining it is the refusal of the nuclear weapons states to make progress on Article 6 of the NPT, the language which requires the acknowledged nuclear weapon states to make progress toward the goal of total elimination of nuclear weapons. That's Article 6 of the non Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. This progress is lacking and, in fact, the reason that new states are seeking nuclear weapons has historically been to defend themselves against invasion and attack by nuclear weapons states. Rather than progress toward disarmament, since 2000, all nine nuclear weapon states have been improving their arsenals and their capacity to use nuclear weapons in warfare, relying on the Cold War concept of mutually assured destruction to deter nuclear attack. U.S. development of anti-ballistic missiles has led to Russian development of newer, more difficult to track nuclear weapons delivery systems, which were on display yesterday at a presentation to the Russian public by President Putin. Alarming threats bouncing back and forth between North Korea and the United States 
threatening fire and fury like the world has never seen and limited bloody nose attacks have made the world realize that relying on nuclear weapons to deter attack depends upon rational leaders and on systems working without failure or without fatal miscommunication. As nuclear weapon states fear losing their ability to use their nuclear weapons if they don't act within minutes of learning of a potential attack. We had close calls during the Cold War in which both U.S. and Soviet armies received signals of impending attack, or in the case of a Soviet submarine during the Cuban Missile Crisis, were attacked by U.S. depth charges and had permission to launch nuclear weapons. But in every case, the individuals chose not to initiate a nuclear war. We cannot continue to rely upon mutually assured destruction to protect us from the horror that would result from a nuclear war and current events show us that we must act, work together to abolish these weapons altogether or one day they will be used. Thank you very much. Um, now we have Ambassador Joanne Adamson. Unfortunately, she can't hear us, so I have to text her so that he, she can continue speaking. I'm sorry about that. Can she see us? No. Hmm. Hello, can you hear me, Atre? Yes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to... Um, to say uh, I'm very sorry I couldn't be with you tonight uh, and the weather conspired against me and uh, almost the technology, it's quite difficult to talk to you when I can't actually see you. Um, but I wanted to say uh, thank you very much for Trey and uh, Dr. Abby Williams for inviting me to be here tonight. I was listening to Alan Rock and um, I'm one of those faceless uh, Brussels bureaucrats, <laughs> uh, but I'm now not in Brussels but in New York working at the United Nations. I'm also one of those people who's trying to um, hold on to the furniture, to keep the furniture intact. And actually, uh, I'm doing that by squatting on the furniture uh, and <laughs> trying to dare people to take it away from me. I want to say just a little bit about uh, where I'm coming from. I'm a British diplomat on secondment to the European Union right now. In the past, I've worked on the arms trade treaty and on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. But I'm speaking tonight uh, in my personal capacity. Uh, I've also since January been uh, part of the Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters, uh, so trying to uh, help him uh, come up with some ideas uh, to how we can uh, overcome the disarmament impasse. What I'd like to do uh, today and tonight in these few uh, minutes is talk actually a little bit about non-proliferation. Uh, I'm sure the previous speaker I couldn't hear uh, was talking a little bit more about disarmament, uh, uh, but I'd like to focus on uh, non-proliferation. Before I do that, though, um, I'm very glad to see the title of the uh, seminar, which is about education and building international citizenry. Uh, I think this is a really important concept. Um, I studied at the, the rival school, the Kennedy School, a couple of years ago, and I do remember one of the most uh, instructive classes I took uh, was about um, ethics of statecraft and looking at nuclear weapons. And uh, I listened to uh, the, the transcripts uh, from when President Kennedy was talking to his cabinet in 1962 in the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's very interesting to listen to those tapes now, uh, given sort of some of the stakes we face these days, and to listen to a real lesson in leadership, how he considered with his military advisors and his attorney general, um, and asked some very difficult questions. It was clear that it was weighing on his shoulders. What would it mean if I were to authorize a nuclear strike against Cuba or the Soviet Union. And I think that in these sort of troubled times, it's, it's worth everyone uh, digging out those, those tapes, which are on the Belfast Center website, very beautifully curated, and really just put yourself back in, in his shoes and think about what you might have done uh, when you were in his shoes. That's a, a little sidebar for uh, what I wanted to say about the European Union's programs on non-proliferation, uh, because that really is the, uh, the area, I guess, where the, the European Union and its member states, the 28 member states, do quite a lot of the bread and butter work uh, to do with non-proliferation. 
So there are a couple of areas I'd like to mention. The first is the work that the European Union does to uh, raise awareness about existing treaties, be they in the chemical, biological or nuclear area, um, and to encourage uh, countries around the world who haven't yet signed up or ratified those treaties to take part, to be part of the global multilateral structure uh, for managing risks, for collectively managing risks. Uh, we do that in different ways. Um, we, first of all, we work with the institutions themselves, so with the United Nations and uh, with the Organization for Chemical Weapons, uh, for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, for the Biological Toxins Weapons Convention, um, and the IAEA. Uh, so, we also, so we work jointly with those institutions to see whether we can support them politically and financially. The second thing we do is work directly with countries themselves who may want to join certain non-proliferation regimes, but do not have the technical capacity or the wherewithal to do so. So we help uh, providing uh, advisors to look at things like national legislation, how to imbue, improve your export controls, how to ratify treaties. And um, I'm sorry if some of this is a little bit dry, and I'm conscious it's Friday night, and I'm probably standing between you and uh, a, a late dinner. Um, but I wanted to just focus on this very much the practical side of cooperation, which is important to an awful lot of countries. And many countries do come to us in Brussels and ask for some help with this, and we are very, very glad uh, to assist. So that's the, the second uh, sort of track, which is very practical, tangible assistance to uh, countries who wish to be part of this global non-proliferation regime. I'd like to turn now to um, Iran and talk a little bit about the Joint Comprehensive Programme of Action. When I do so, though, I'd like to make a, a link to North Korea. Um, I myself think that it's no coincidence that the negotiations on the Iran deal started back in 2003, which also happened to be around the time that North Korea was uh, making firm its withdrawal from the non-proliferation treaty. So I know that there are always a lot of, sort of local um, Middle Eastern issues or particular regimes in Tehran that may have driven a number of policymakers to want to talk to Iran about its nuclear program. But I don't think we should ignore that coincidence that this was just at the time when North Korea uh, first said, I'm going to withdraw from the NPT. So that was in policymakers' minds. So why did a group of countries come together back in 2003 to start? Now, at that time, it was uh, the UK, France and Germany. Uh, the US was not yet involved in the uh, discussions. And I do remember at the time I was posted in Washington and one of my bosses from London uh, was in town. And I remember that then President Bush came uh, sort of into a room where he was meeting and said, what on earth are you doing with Iran? What are these talks about? Uh, you know, you better watch yourself. So um, it, it was even then sort of very interesting to, uh, to the presidential uh, side. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, it was interesting, but a little bit disturbing to uh, the senior officials. People persisted with those uh, talks. And I think the reason they persisted was quite clear. Uh, at that time, it, it was obvious that Iran was uh, sort of stepping up its capacity to enrich uranium uh, and perhaps to look at how to, uh, to, to, to get hold of plutonium as well. So it was obvious we were in a race against time. Now, there were many ebbs and flows in that nuclear deal, how it was done, uh, and different leaders in Iran. Uh, but finally, in 2015, uh, along with the Obama administration then, we were able to, um, to seal the deal. And I'd like to sort of to underline the fact that um, this was something which sought to change uh, what, what looked to be a changing strategic nuclear balance in the Middle East. We were very worried that um, Iran was going to acquire the capacity to be able to develop its own nuclear weapons. And the way we saw to combat that was to go after the um, and, and uranium enrichment infrastructure. Um, so I would argue that uh, you know one can one can discuss disarmament, and I'd be very happy to discuss that in the Q and A if somebody texts me the questions. Um, but I would say that the, the non-proliferation side of this and working very much on the technological side and the infrastructure uh, of Iran's um, uh, different different sites was critical. And also, as part of the deal, having Iran stay within the non-proliferation treaty to accept the oversight from the International Atomic Energy Agency to accept the additional protocol, uh, which would allow a lot more monitoring of, of Iran than, than was there in, prior to that. Now, I know now there's a lot of, um, uh, a lo a lot of 
uh, talk about the Iran deal and people say that uh, it is insufficient. Now, I'm, I'm not here tonight to, to defend the deal as perfect. What I would argue on the Iran deal is that it does address the nuclear aspects, the nuclear weapons aspects. The IAEA, since the deal was, um, was concluded, has reported eight times that Iran is complying with the nuclear aspects. Uh, and uh, we, the European Union, convened a meeting with all of the partners to the deal last autumn, and nobody around the table, including the US representative, said that Iran was breaching this nuclear deal. But I do just want to stress, I'm talking about the nuclear side of the deal. My own view on uh, the things that are happening in the region and how we might address those, because there are, there are different aspects. There's Iran's support for um, Hezbollah, there's Iran's uh, support for, for Syria, for Bashar al-Assad. Uh, the way I think um, those uh, issues need to be addressed is, is a, a, a few different ways. One is to, um, to implement the, um, the WMD free zone in the Middle East, which was agreed at the NPT review conference in 2010. I think actually uh, moving forward on the WMD free zone would get the countries concerned into a discussion of collective security and regional security. I think a number of actors could tighten up um, the exports of components uh, to the region. I'm talking about uh, Russia in particular, who I think could influence Iran on the behavior towards, uh, to, towards Syria. Uh, but also in, in Yemen and elsewhere, and the threat that Iran is posing to Israel. Um, I would also like, as Alan said earlier, talking about the Security Council, I think when we have proof of um, activities in something like Yemen, where we've seen uh, some missiles which seem to have Iranian origin, then uh, we should be able to pass a resolution which, which asks Iran to actually be part of the non-proliferation regime and uh, investigate how that might have happened in Yemen. Uh, the final thing is I do wonder whether uh, we are at a point where we need something like a Helsinki-type arrangement that happened in Europe, where uh, a number of countries you know, came together during the Cold War and decided they needed a collective security arrangement, which became the OSCE. Right now, when you look at the tensions between Iran and its uh, mainly Sunni neighbors, um, it, it seems to me inevitable that uh, you would have to have some kind of collective security arrangement uh, that you might want to uh, suggest that as a, as a way out of the current competition and rivalry that you have at the moment between Iran and, on the other hand, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, um, the UAE and Egypt, and on the other hand, you have Qatar with Iran. So I think it's a, a very complex, dangerous and difficult situation. But I think one of the elements going beyond the technical things I'm talking about on non-proliferation um, is to look at how do those countries uh, with their historic rivalries and uh, one might say they wish to be the hegemon of the region, how do you bring them into a more cooperative uh, arrangement, rather as we did in Europe after the Second World War, when we'd had more than a century of uh, territorial land grabs and wars, uh, how might we move towards that? Um, I, will, I will stop there, because I'm interested in uh, sort of taking any questions. I do apologize, I, I can't see you face to face. I'd love to have been with you there, um, and perhaps, uh, Abby, I could come up another time. Thank you very much. Now I'll invite Dr. Matthew Duchatel to give his opening remarks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, I'm, ev I'm even more aware now how lucky I am to actually be here. Uh, <laughs> my flight was canceled yesterday, but not today. Uh, and I very much enjoyed the opportunity uh, to actually make a contribution to the discussion in the, in the US regarding these issues. Um, I'm going to focus my remarks on, on North Korea and address two questions in my preliminary remarks. First question, uh, what do we know uh, hearing North Korean voices from, about what, how they would respond uh, to a limited strike? Uh, they talk about it. And secondly, um, is there still space for diplomacy with regards to uh, nuclear disarmament in North Korea? Um, so, first question, the military option. I've spent the past six years um, working on uh, Chinese sources, uh, trying to understand the Chinese debates regarding North Korea policy, and also trying to learn uh, from the Chinese about North Korea. 
And hence, I've been very um, surprised uh, during recent interviews conducted last December, hearing from uh, Chinese uh, experts of North Korea the following argument. So the argument goes that way. Um, North Korea is a rational actor, uh, and we all know that. Um, and um, North Korea as a rational strategic actor is proliferating uh, to serve the goal of regime survival. And because North Korea is a rational actor, uh, it would swallow a limited strike on its missile sites and on its proliferating uh, nuclear sites without retaliation uh, because at some point North Korea will have to seek to avoid escalation. The logic is that escalation works only to a certain degree for the North Koreans. Uh, there is brinkmanship through you know, repeated tests of ballistic missiles and also nuclear warheads. Uh, and this is a form of very high risk escalation for the North Koreans that serve the goal of regime survival. But once uh, there is really a military engagement occurring uh, on North Korean soil in the form of limited strikes against North Korean capacities, then the rational decision uh, for the North Koreans uh, would be to just accept it and refrain from retaliation because retaliation leads, leads to escalation and escalation leads to the defeat of North Korea. Uh, this is the argument. Uh, this is not an argument that was invented in China. In fact, the Chinese are reacting to an argument that comes from the United States. Um, and I think it's worth asking the question, you know, how would the North Koreans really react uh, if this was the option taken by the US at some point uh, now that the Olympics uh, are over. The North Koreans talk about it, actually. Uh, when you translate what they write uh, in their uh, publications, in their official journals, uh, and there's a lot of uh, discussion, not discussions, but points made regarding how they would use uh, their nuclear weapons in a conflict. And in fact, it can be summarized in just two words, um, preempting decapitation. Uh, that's how I would characterize uh, the North Korean thinking regarding using nuclear weapons. What they say is they face, from their perspective, the risk of a strike on their capacities, either limited or, uh, you know, full scale. Uh, and they warn uh, the US, the Republic of Korea, the international community, that if they detect the preparation of such an imminent attack, their reaction would be a preemptive nuclear strike. It's written black on white in all North Korean publications regarding nuclear weapons. Is this credible? Um, there's a double dynamic, I think, uh, in this kind of game between the possibility of a limited strike and the type of answer that would come from North Korea if this was really in the making. I think on the one hand, um, the U.S. has absolutely no certainty regarding the exact location of all, uh, you know, the ballistic missile sites uh, and uh, the nuclear sites on North Korean soil, uh, which gives space uh, to North Korea to formulate such a doctrine of preemptive strikes against the United States. But at the same time, it's also impossible for North Korea to have the certainty uh, that they can survive uh, a first strike by the United States. And this is a major incentive for the North Koreans to actually continue developing their program and continue testing because the rationality of uh, developing the nuclear weapons is that at some point they will want to own a second strike capacity precisely because their number one consideration is how to deal with the risk of limited strike. So on the one hand you have uncertainty and on the other hand you have uncertainty as well. Um, and this is, I think, one of the key dynamic in the, in the North Korean equation at the moment. A point on diplomacy. I think that at this stage, there is absolutely no space for nuclear disarmament talks, uh, but I see some space for crisis management talks, and it's a very different thing. Uh, someone from uh, actually Peking University once characterized the Chinese policy uh, towards North Korea the following way, you know. Uh, it's very well known that uh, China has three goals, uh, no nuclear weapons, no war, no chaos. Uh, and these three goals, according to this scholar from Peking University, are incompatible. They are not compatible. You cannot have the three at the same time. I think it's a little bit the same with regards to talks. 
you cannot have talks that achieve both peace and disarmament. Um, so I'd say a few things about uh, diplomacy in the case of North Korea. Number one, the model of Iran, the joint comprehensive program of action, cannot re be replicated in the case of North Korea for at least three reasons. First, the behavior of North Korea and the attitude of North Korea. The goal today is to be recognized as a nuclear weapon state. Um, there is absolutely no interest in such a format. There is no interest in an involvement for external from external stakeholders such as the EU. Um, and, um, and this is an issue of disarmament, not an issue of dismantlement or containment of existing facilities. So this is a very different situation. Secondly, by comparison with the Iran deal, there cannot be a deal that is satisfying with North Korea that is only focusing on nuclear capacities. It has to also target the ballistic missiles, and it would be very different. Um, today, this is one of the most controversial areas with the GP, uh, GCPOA, um, but in the case of North Korea, even if you strike a deal uh, on nuclear weapons, I think that the issue of uh, North Korean threats would not be fully addressed because with ballistic missile capacities plus chemical and biological weapons, uh, the capacity of North Korea to use weapons of mass destruction is still not addressed. And thirdly, uh, and it's a, a key point regarding feasibility, um, when you look at the Iran deal, it's a very sophisticated uh, and very actually deep verification regime uh, that is implemented by a UN agency, uh, the IAEA. Uh, in the past, verification, the verification issue killed the negotiations uh, with North Korea. Uh, and in the case of Iran, verification is there to replace the lack of trust. But I think that in the case of North Korea, the, distr the distrust is so deep uh, that no verification regime would be satisfying for, for both sides, acceptable to the North Koreans and uh, credible for the United States. So leaving this aside, what can be actually possibly done in terms of exploring the diplomatic space? I think very little, honestly. Um, but there is some space to uh, promote the idea of crisis management. Um, and I think that Europe can make a contribution. Uh, there are different views in Europe. If you take a Swedish view, uh, there is a very strong belief that, uh, you know, Sweden could serve as a bridge between the US and, and, and North Korea. If you take a French or a British view, there is not so much belief in uh, any role that Europe could play in bridging the gap. Um, crisis management is needed. Um, there is a need for crisis management talks to instill some degree of stability um, in the relationship between the US and North Korea, but it's extremely uh, improbable that this will actually take place. Uh, and when you listen to the North Koreans, they say, precisely because of the issue I described in the first part, um, that given the risk they perceive of a limited strike, uh, they need to have a better um, understanding of what is happening around the Korean Peninsula to make sure that you know, the maneuvers that are taking place are not a preparation for uh, a military attack. Uh, so they want some sort of a joint notification mechanism uh, to actually uh, ensure that uh, you know, there is no covert action. Um, and in there, uh, there is, from their perspective, a need for crisis management talks, uh, which will clearly not be accepted uh, on the part of the US. But I think that there is some space elsewhere uh, for crisis management, and that is um, in bringing the five main parties, by which I mean the five parties of the six party talks less uh, North Korea, to actually discuss how they would react uh, to incidents surrounding the North Korean nuclear problem. And I'm giving you only uh, two examples. Uh, if you have one nuclear test in North Korea that produces a radiation leak uh, towards northeastern China or Russia, how do the parties react? No one knows, and it's a pot it has a strong potential to lead to some sort of a crisis. If you have a North Korean ballistic missile test that leads uh, to casualties in Japan or 
on a Japanese fishing boat. What comes next? In fact, no one knows uh, because these discussions are not taking place. Uh, these discussions could take place if China was more willing to accept contingency planning discussions, but China is not, um, or China is very reluctant. The reason being that from the Chinese perspective, each crisis scenario that leads to escalation ultimately leads to the end of the North Korean regime. So being involved in crisis management talks means indirectly endorsing the idea of regime change. This has to change, um, and, uh, and I think that Europe can play a small role. And if you give me one more minute, um, I'll, make a, I'll make a final point. I think that you know, the international community agrees on sanctions. Um, there is a problem with sanctions implementation. There is a problem with deepening the sanctions regime. Uh, the sanctions regime is increasingly getting close to a full embargo, even though we are not there. Uh, but the approach centered on sanctions, even though um, there is a lot of problems with sanctions implementation, hides the fact that, in fact, uh, there is a very deep division that is actually widening between two camps. Uh, on the one hand, you have the U.S.-Japan alliance that believes in maximum pressure, uh, including through the veiled threat of uh, limited strikes. And on the, on the other hand, you have the Sino-Russian proposition uh, of a double freeze, freezing the um, annual joint exercises between the US and the ROK against a freeze of North Korean testing activities. Um, and I think that um, the space that North Korea has today to advance its program is to some degree linked to the space there is between these two positions that are, in fact, completely opposed. Um, so sanctions are almost like a fig leaf hiding the deep division of the international community. And if there is something that is urgently needed is to find a way to actually reduce the gap between these two positions. Um, and I think that um, there is no way but to engage uh, with the Sino-Russian proposal for a double freeze to change it and to make it much more, uh, you know, uh, much stronger and much more credible because as it is now, it's not acceptable for any party uh, outside China and Russia, but at least it provides, you know, a sort of uh, a benchmark. Uh, this is the only proposition on the table and there needs to be some sort of an exchange uh, with, the, with the two, with, with China and Russia uh, to reach some sort of an understanding regarding how to address North Korea diplomatically. At this time, I would request um, the panelists to ask questions between themselves, and if not, I'll ask a question, and we can then give it to the audience after that. I have a question for Matthew, and that was, uh, what role, I heard you talk about a lot of different uh, countries that uh, might get involved in negotiating uh, some sort of an agreement, and, uh, and I appreciate all the detail and, and the information that you shared, but I'm wondering, what role do you think South Korea, as the uh, sort of the country in the crosshairs at this point, um, could play in this, in this, and and is playing, and seems to be playing right now in, in this effort to avoid war with North Korea. Should I answer now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I think a lot of people were quite surprised uh, yeah. to learn that uh, the two Koreas had been conducting direct talks. Um, before December in Pyongyang to prepare for what we are seeing now, uh, which is the resumption of diplomacy. Uh, I think probably a temporary one uh, because the joint exercises between the US and the ROK will resume and this will have consequences. Um, but clearly I think that uh, the South Korean administration, the Moon administration has been trying to reach two goals. Uh, the first one is to reduce the risk of uh, actually a limited strike uh, 
uh, by the United States. Uh, and on, on this particular issue, I think that there is an understanding between the two Koreas. Uh, and the second goal has been to regain uh, some initiative uh, because after the election of President Moon, South Korea was completely deprived of any space for conducting its own inter-Korean policy. Um, and I described the two camps, the double freeze versus the maximum pressure. Um, uh, and South Korea is now occupying a space in the middle. How long will it be able to occupy that space? I think it's an open question. Uh, I, I tend to see the, the current balance as, uh, as temporary. Um, Master uh, Adamson would also answer the question, so uh, I'll just tell her to begin her remarks. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm now sort of able to follow the, the web stream, so I'm, I'm back with you in the room. Um, I wanted to just make a, a, a comment on uh, Charles's this question um, and, and talking about, um, you know, the, the prospects for the, the two careers coming together. Because clearly, uh, when we talk about nuclear disarmament, it doesn't happen in, in isolation. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I'm now able to follow the, the web stream, so I'm, I'm back with you in the room. Um, so, I wanted to just make a, a, a comment. There is a bit of a delay in, uh, in hearing myself through the web stream, so please forgive me. Um, one of the things uh, observers who are in Pyongyang say, say to us is that um, sanctions don't actually bite an awful lot because North Korea in general, outside of Pyongyang, is so underdeveloped you know, people are doing things with handheld tools, and there isn't a lot of infrastructure to squeeze through sanctions. And so, therefore, the way to uh, proceed along the path of trying to have dialogue and, uh, you know, to use the, the, the two careers is actually more about having more people-to-people -people contacts uh, and to, to enable somehow uh, the people of, of North Korea to to know what people from the South are like, people from the West are like. Um, so I didn't want to at all get into the sort of, uh, you know, the, the details of uh, how, how might um, uh, freeze for freeze go forward. But I wanted to throw in the diplomatic uh, view that if you look at what happened in, um, in, in Germany, in East and West Germany, uh, before the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, you did find in the end it was some sort of access to information, people moving around. That, that in the end had some impact on the resolution. I'll, I'll stop there, because it's hard to sort of keep up with the, the, the feedback from the link. Okay. I, I would like to ask a question to Ambassador Adamson. Um, so the next report of the UN panel of experts of the Sanctions Committee on North Korea documents uh, proliferation from North Korea to Syria of ballistic technology plus uh, chemical weapons elements. This is really something that is happening um, in the vicinity of Europe. Do you think that Europe can do more to better enforce the UN sanctions? I'm going to text her, text her the question. Do you want to answer the question for her? No, I think not. Okay. Um, so in the, in the time I text the question to, Mr., uh, to the ambassador, I would, I would be selfish and ask a question for myself. So this question is to both the panelists. So to what extent do you think strategic strangulation through sanctions and other means has been successful in stopping the pervasive spread of nuclear weapons? Since it has arguably not been successful with North Korea, India, or Pakistan, does this approach have any viability in the future? And what are the other ways of looking to stop nuclear weapons? Of course, the approach we're, we're taking is not one of sanctions, but of, uh, of agreeing to abolish nuclear weapons entirely uh, and, and on the part of all nations of the world. So it's a totally different approach than that. But um, so, yeah, in, in terms of what our organization is involved in, it, this 
you know, this approach is not one that we particularly favor or oppose. Um, and uh, I, I would say, though, that, that it, you know, efforts that have been made to get Iran to agree to not to continue to develop nuclear weapons, um, things that ease sanctions and, and that open up dialogue and, and the discussion that, that Matthew just, or excuse me, that Ambassador Adamson had and also Matthew had about the uh, South Korea, um, South Korea's involvement in trying to negotiate with North Korea. I think that to the extent that sanctions create some tension in one direction, um, hopefully what can happen from that is uh, rather than cornering a country that, a, that a, a way out can be seen by that country. I think it's very destructive and dangerous when you set up sanctions with no way out for the country that, that at least from their own perception, that, uh, that they have to go. And so that would be my concern that with the situation in North Korea right now, and also my concern that may occur with Iran if the Trump administration irrationally uh, destroys the Iran Treaty. <clears throat> well, learning from the, the case of North Korea, you have um, you know, different possible views. Um, one view that uh, you often hear in China, but that was most recently articulated by Vladimir Putin, is that, you know, no sanctions will work. I think he used the word, you know, rather eat grass than really increase the nuclear program. Um, but there's also another view, uh, which is that the sanctions regime is not well implemented uh, and is far from perfect, uh, and that there is a lot of uh, evasion activities uh, conducted by the North Koreans. Uh, it's really worth reading uh, in, de in details the annual or the now the, 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 the reports of the panel of experts on sanctions evasion um, because it documents very well the uh, evasion activities uh, and in some cases it's even able to attach uh, a number for the revenues that these evasion activities are providing North Korea with. Um, I think that there is a major issue with, uh, with, with sanctions enforcement. Uh, it's very much uh, linked to the problem of implementation in China. Uh, I think that China, the Ministry of Public Security in China, has the resources to actually track uh, what is happening on Chinese soil better than that. Um, and uh, it's not really putting a lot of efforts on sanctions uh, enforcement, even though you have also to actually give credit to China because in the past 10 years, the Chinese policy on sanctions has completely shifted. Um, it has shifted, but not to the point uh, that China is willing to enforce sanctions to a full degree. Um, and uh, and this, is the case of, uh, is, this is the case in particular of oil. Uh, but when you look at the contentious issues at the UN Security Council, what you can observe is that um, what was a no-go in the past. Um, for example, just three years ago, uh, there was a debate between comprehensive sanctions versus targeted sanctions and the humanitarian exemption. Uh, humanitarian exemption was really the argument uh, on the Chinese side that you cannot you know, prevent North Korean individuals from uh, gaining um, revenues. Uh, so for example, seafood products would not be sanctioned. Now, seafood products are being sanctioned. So the humanitarian exemption is no longer a key argument at the UN Security Council to discuss sanctions related to North Korea. Same with oil. Uh, three years ago, the principle of including oil uh, in, the, in, the, in the package of sanctions was excluded by the Chinese side. Now the principle of having oil is there. It's in the last resolutions. And uh, my best bet is that it will become increasingly strict on uh, oil exports to North Korea. Same with North Korean workers. Uh, two years ago, it was absolutely unacceptable uh, for, se for several states to target North Korean workers and sanction uh, you know, the possibility of having North Korean workers on, on your territory. Now the principle of sanctioning North Korean laborers is included in the UN 
sanctions regime. Uh, so step by step, we are getting very close to an embargo, but it's an embargo that is not an embargo yet and that is not fully enforced. Um, so I think that there is still a logic um, given the huge difficulty to restart diplomacy centered on disarmament, uh, given also the risk of confrontation, uh, I think that the best bet is still to improve the efficiency of the sanctions regime. Thank you. Now, uh, Ambassador. Thanks very much, Otre. Um, so going back, there were two questions. One first from Mathieu about uh, the report of the panel of experts from on DPRK and the links possibly to Syria. And uh, the second was your own question about um, you know, to what extent uh, can we rely on the sort of non-proliferation regime to work? Um, first one um, to, to Mathieu. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, sort of where we started with uh, Libya denuclearization and the uh, revelations that the AQ Khan network in Pakistan was in fact sort of trading. There was an illicit trade going on. And, and what we produced after that was UN Resolution 1540 uh, to, to try and clamp down on uh, proliferation on, on these networks. I think um, we need to look at the sort of refreshing revival of how we've been doing on uh, 1540. Uh, that would mean that uh, a coming together of those who can influence uh, transfers by, by air, land, or sea. I think for that to work, um, the, one of the key actors is Russia. I keep going back to Russia because I think that um, you know, uh, the guardians, if you want to say, of the non-proliferation side of the NPT uh, will, will very much include the UN agencies, but also some of those um, people who are involved in uh, peaceful nuclear technology transfers, I, I, I put it that way. So the pillar three of the non-proliferation treaty, uh, access to peaceful uses. So I think we need a revitalization of um, 1540 to look at uh, whether it's effective. Secondly, though, um, we need, when a panel of experts reports to the Security Council and it is discussed in the Council, as was the case with the transfer of missiles to the Houthis in Yemen, um, it cannot be that uh, the Security Council sort of shrugs its shoulders, uh, or at least on, on the part of some of them, refuses to even uh, contemplate asking for an investigation as to how did those missiles get to Yemen. So uh, again, it does bring us back to something Alan Rock was saying earlier about the effectiveness of the Security Council, not just about the membership, but is the Security Council doing its job, be it in um, peacekeeping in Africa or in um, applying its own rules. Um, but I, I do agree with you that uh, you know, the, the panel of experts report from, from uh, DPRK must be uh, thoroughly examined. Uh, back to you, Atre, on the, you know, what can we do is the existing uh, regime working? Uh, I, I go back to uh, the non-proliferation treaty itself and its three pillars, disarmament, non-proliferation, and then the peaceful uses. Um, I think that, you know, the, the implementation is only as strong as the political will across those three pillars of the treaty. So indeed, on the, the second pillar, the non-proliferation side, it, is, it does need a, a coming together of um, all those who uh, may have access to technology or able to uh, close down methods of transmission of, of technology. I think also that on the, um, on the disarmament uh, area, I think a discussion of salience and you know, why, do, why do countries have nuclear weapons, the kind of thing that started after the 2010 review conference between the five nuclear weapon states was getting a little bit closer to talking about, well, what is it? Uh, why do you have these nuclear weapons? That, with the uh, declining U.S.-Russia relations, sort of stopped and, and trailed off. But I think, along with um, you know the sort of the uh, the the, uh, the focus on non-proliferation, we we do need to to be able to come back to this discussion of salience de-escalation, uh, because in the long term, uh, you know, if you uh, if if you want to uh, control people's sort of appetite for uh, nuclear weapons, it's not only about cutting down the pathways by which they can get hold of it, um, but it's also to reinforce the whole bargain, the nuclear bargain, getting towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, so I hope perhaps, uh, you know, Charles and I could have a, a further discussion of that face to face sometime. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We would now like to invite members of the audience to ask questions. There are two mics, one in the middle and one right at the aisle. We ask that you line up behind those to ensure that we are able to address as many questions as possible. 
please keep your question to a minute and to one panelist. Please also state your name. I would request the members of the audience to ask one question only. Thank you. So good evening and thank you. <clears throat> okay. So good evening and uh, thank you. Closer to the mic. Yeah. There yeah. You go. Okay. <laughs> So good evening and thank you everyone. My name is Serafim. I'm from the University of Haifa, Israel. And I wanted to address a subject which is a bit of esoteric, but also non-proliferation. A couple of months ago in the Bulletin of Nuclear Scientists, there's been an article about the possible implementation of the blockchain technology in export control and non-proliferation as the concept of an open but encrypted and kind of anonymous but still open to everybody a clearance and a controlling means and I wanted to it's mostly directed to Mr. Duchatel and uh, Ambassador Adamson but if Mr. Johnson has something interesting to say about that I'll be glad to hear I would like to, to hear opinions about the blockchain technology and its possible implementation in um, export control and non-proliferation, specifically in dual-use goods. I think it's more for the ambassador than for me. Is your question? Oh, okay. uh, yeah. I, this is an interesting, very interesting question, which I do not have the answer to. Okay. <laughs> so the ambassador will get back in five mi in two minutes. <laughs> Until that point of time, we can go to the next question, and then we can come back to you. I'm sorry about that. Hello, my name is Dr. Fedor Wojtolowski. I'm uh, from EMMO, Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, I have a question concerning a uh, comprehensive common action plan. Uh, President Donald Trump has strongly criticized it several times, and now the position of American administration is rather controversial. So how could uh, uh, withdrawal from comprehensive common action plan uh, influence on uh, um, on the behavior of North Korea and on non-proliferation regime in general. Thank you. So, as I took your question to be, how can uh, how does the Trump administration have credibility uh, by pulling out of uh, the uh, climate treaty? Uh, in terms of it following, expecting other countries to sign treaties with us or, or to follow treaties? Is that what you were asking? I wasn't clear. Uh, I'm asking if uh, the eclipse of uh, the com comprehensive common action plan regime uh, will uh, cause, uh, uh, cause uh, you know, a very active uh, position on, of North Korea not to be engaged in any talks and how it can influence on the non-proliferation regime in general. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a good question. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't think it fundamentally changes the calculus of the North Koreans. Clearly, uh, it reinforces the main threat perception in North Korea that, you know, the ultimate policy in particular of the United States, uh, is about regime change. I think that this is the very fundamental issue uh, seen from a North Korean perspective. Um, and there is also the sense that, um, you know, this is about um, uh, disarming countries to, in a second step, uh, provoke a regime change. And, and on that, the lesson was learned from the case of Libya, and I think that the perception is very stable. Um, and, and and so I think it doesn't fundamentally changes the way they look at their own nuclear weapons. Uh, but it's also because the development of nuclear weapons by North Korea now is no longer linked uh, to the changes in policies by the states that surround North Korea and of the United States. I think that for a very long time there was a debate regarding whether developing nuclear weapons was you know, to gain leverage, uh, to develop a bargaining chip, to get a good deal. Um, and now it's very clear that it's about uh, the status of North Korea in world politics. Um, so I think that this goal is set very clearly. Uh, it's articulated so that everyone can understand it. 
Uh, and I don't think that the tactical changes, uh, especially with regards to arms control negotiations, fundamentally alter the, the goal of North Korea. So overall, I would say that the argument that you know, the Trump administration's undermining of uh, the agreement with Iran is actually bolstering North Korea is wrong uh, because you know, the policy of North Korea is very much set uh, and uh, is not going to change. Now we're just waiting for um, the ambassador to answer the previous question. Uh, thanks very much, Atre. Um, I assume I can speak now. I do apologize to the room if I'm, I'm butting in now at this point. It's hard to uh, follow. On blockchain, very interesting question. Um, on, on the one hand, um, you, know, you can see from the news about how North Korea might be using blockchain to, uh, to trade in currency to enable them to, um, to replenish their coffers. So um, essentially, block trade, you, you could see it on the one hand as a kind of smuggling or a evading rules and institutions, which clearly goes against uh, what we're trying to do on uh, enforcing sanctions. Um, on the other hand, I guess if, if the blockchain um, phenomenon that you're thinking of is one where there is a community of people watching what everyone else is doing, uh, and so if the IAEA inspectors were somehow able to be part of the blockchain universe, um, it might be a way to, um, to actually uh, have more oversight. Um, but I think fundamentally, uh, you know, blockchain in this capacity must be seen as something which is unregulated and seeks to bypass and therefore, it's something to be to be wary of, uh, and to think of how to counter uh, what the effects of of blockchain. Um, on the question about um, would a U.S. Uh, standing back from the JCPOA influence North Korea, I think I agree with Mathieu on this that um, the North Korean uh, approach on on nuclear weapons is to um, is to avoid a decapitation of the regime. So it is about um, survival. But what I would say is that from a European point of view, the JCPOA um, is in itself uh, a very innovative way to take a series of rather complicated uh, issues on, on the nuclear side and also to look at how you monitor and enforce um, oversight. And it was in, in its own way a success. So um, I think it would be a bad signal um, if that model, which is a after many, many years um, of concern about increasing uh, uranium enrichment um, and really Iran being on the cusp of changing the strategic nuclear balance in the Middle East. Uh, the fact that we, we found um, a way to come together uh, with so many different partners and which has now been endorsed in the UN Security Council, um, that would be just a damaging sign of its own right, irrespective of what it says to um, North Korea. I happen to think that on the approach to Iran, what the U.S. is most uh, interested in in its behavior is not so much about regime change. Um, it's more about protection of allies, uh, in particular Israel, uh, but also protection of um, the, the, some of the Gulf allies. So um, I think when I, when I read, if I compare, for example, the run-up to the Iraq invasion and regime change there, and what you see from, from the U.S., it is... It is very much about um, stopping behavior, which is seen as destabilizing uh, terrorism, et cetera, rather than going after the regime in, in Tehran. You do see things from the US about human rights in Iran, um, but it is more about the here and now of protecting allies. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to add one thing. Now that I understand what you were asking, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand what you were saying. Um, the danger in rejecting that treaty is that we'll repeat history with, with North Korea. I mean, the uh, Bush administration, um, the George W. Bush administration, um, rejected Clinton's treaty with, with North Korea when they discovered that an alternative path had been created for uh, developing uh, uh, weapons-grade materials and uh, decided to try and get tough with North Korea leading to the situation we now find. If, uh, I'm, I'm fearful that, that uh, the Trump administration is in danger of repeating history and, and, uh, and getting Iran back on the path toward developing nuclear weapons, um, just as, as we did in the case of North Korea after 2002. 
Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Carlos Sirisari, and I'm a freshman uh, with the Indie Epic Colloquium. Uh, my question is directed towards Dr. Duchatel. Um, I have um, a question regarding, uh, so the news cycle over the past few months has been, and, and I apologize in advance if you wanted to avoid this topic, I know it's a bit controversial, uh, but the news cycle over the past few months have been, has been dominated with articles that say over and over that a meaningful resolution to the North Korean problem will have to wait for the end of the Donald Trump presidency. First of all, do you think this is a myth? And second of all, if you believe it to be true, can we afford to wait until the end of the Donald Trump presidency? <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> it's not that it's controversial, it's that um, it really depends on what you call a resolution. Uh, do you mean disarmament or do you mean, you know, a peace treaty? Um, is there a resolution for you that accepts uh, the existence of North Korea as a nuclear state, or no? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I'd say... No, it's very important, because if yeah, you don't tell course. me, I'll have trouble answering that. I, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think I would answer that by saying that whatever you believe to be a meaningful resolution, do you think that can be achieved? Whether it's disarmament, if you believe that that's the meaningful solution, whatever you believe to mm -hmm. be a meaningful solution, do you think it can be reached during Donald Trump's presidency? And if not, can we afford to wait until the end of his presidency, given the urgency? I think that, I mean, to, to be fair uh, to the Trump administration, uh, who made a lot of inflammatory comments that, uh, you know, resulted in uh, heightening tensions around North Korea, um, this has been a problem for many years, uh, the resumption of the North Korea nuclear program, the exit from NPT, uh, the test starting from 2006, uh, and the resolve of the North Koreans uh, has not changed, actually. Um, I don't see a resolution in the coming years. Uh, actually, the whole point of my presentation was to argue that uh, I didn't see any space for successful nuclear disarmament talks. Um, I see some space for a freeze, even though it would be highly difficult, even though uh, there is a very strong possibility that the North Koreans would violate the agreement uh, because they need testing uh, to ensure that they develop the capacity to survive a first strike and they are not there yet. Um, so, um, and I think that a freeze is problematic for many states. I mean, not only the US, for states in Europe, agreeing to a freeze is not an option at all today uh, because it's political in the sense that agreeing to a freeze means agreeing to the existence of you know, North Korea as a nuclear state. So it's basically breaking the taboo. Um, so no, I don't see any possibility uh, for a successful disarmament negotiation during the Trump administration, um, but it's very much linked to the strategic intention of North Korea and to the capacity of North Korea to withstand pressure. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a third year student. Um, my name is Leila. I'm a third year student at Tufts and I'm part of the Epic Ung Colloquium. Um, I'm originally from China, so I'm very intrigued to hear that Dr. Duchatel, uh, you studied the Chinese perspective on North Korea. Um, I'm open to hear your uh, uh, other panel's opinion as well. But my question is more like, um, when you talk about contingency talks, would um, the potential cost of uh, North Koreans um, pressuring the border of, uh, of China and South, South Korea be part of that too. Because from the Chinese and South Korean perspective, there's a, a tremendous cost of un unifying the peninsula, uh, especially and economically and um, just the people f flowing. And that, um, according to Dr. Um, Victor Cha and from, from South Korea, is the um, ma major drive for the humanitarian aid flowing in from South Korea and China. Um, do you see a space for um, the, the other countries supporting uh, to cover those co um, costs in the contingency talks that you mentioned? Mm -hmm. In your question, you are assuming that contingency talks necessarily leads to you know, a collapse of the regime in North Korea 
with a huge uh, refugees crisis in northeastern China and possibly also in Russia. Um, I think it's clearly the main concern on the Chinese side uh, that agreeing to contingency talks accelerates, in fact, uh, such an outcome. And this is the reason why, politically, China has been very reluctant to accept such talks. Um, but at the same time, you also have to see that by uh, refusing to enter such talks, the Chinese are sending to North Korea the signal that the international community is completely divided. Um, and I think that um, this signal is heard <laughs> in, in North Korea. Um, and I also think that, you know, when you frame contingency planning talks, uh, you choose topics, uh, and there are ways to choose topics to avoid uh, having a discussion that is used politically to signal to the North Koreans that China is actually possibly accepting the idea of a regime change in North Korea. Um, so that's why I suggest that such talks could focus on only the issue of dealing with incidents, uh, avoiding that the parties around North Korea behave in ways that are completely unplanned uh, and unforeseen in case a crisis occurs or a specific incident um, occurs. And that does not necessarily mean that China is endorsing the idea of regime change, but it means that, um, you know, the division of the main parties is reduced. And I think that this would be a, a very positive development um, altogether. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Ambassador Adamson would answer the previous question. Yeah, thanks very much, Otro. Um, I just wanted to uh, come back with a comment on the, the question about do we have to wait till the end of the Trump administration? Um, what I would say on that is I think one, one can get sort of mesmerized and focused a lot on the rhetoric battle that goes on. Um, but I think Mathieu's point about you know, North Korea not being ready to engage in anything uh, unless it's about uh, something that isn't nuclear disarmament is a fundamental one. So um, it's, it's not just because Donald Trump is in the White House that um, it's difficult to have a prospect of, of meaningful talks. The fact that um, the White House made clear that Mike Pence was willing to have a meeting in the margins of the Olympics I think is actually, um, you know, makes clear that if they didn't want to give that signal, they wouldn't have released that news uh, if that was, was supposed to happen as a meeting and then it was cancelled. So um, I think the, the problem is, as Mathieu has suggested, uh, predates this uh, administration. It's simply that the rhetoric um, that we see is, is really shone uh, a light on it more, but it is about regime survival. Um, and the, uh, on the second question that, that was just asked um, about humanitarian side, just to note that uh, sort of right now, the biggest uh, donors of aid are, are Switzerland and the EU into um, North Korea. The UN is, in fact, quite a small player on the humanitarian side. But knowing the EU as I do, um, if there were to be a situation where more was required on the humanitarian side, I have no doubt that um, the EU and others would uh, offer that, provided it was able to get through. I mean, we see in Syria every day that we can't actually get the aid through to the people who need it across the lines because it's obstructed by the Assad regime. So the, the pockets are quite deep, but it's a, a question of whether those parties in the region, the North Koreans and the Chinese, would allow an expansion of humanitarian assistance. But Europe would always be there, I believe, if they're asked on humanitarian side. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. Um, Lisa Hemmerle from Trinity College Dublin. And I can absolutely agree with you um, that North Korea is definitely not in this stage where we should talk about disarmament. But um, the deep underlying question is, how can we restore trust? And I think everyone knows from experience that rebuilding trust is one of the most difficult tasks. Um, and I'm wondering, um, because we have to face a very conflict sensitive approach, but also multi-level approach depending or regarding the relation of South Korea to North Korea, which is a very familiar uh, family conflict when we go back to the Sunshine Policy and all the attempts to family reunification. 
Um, but when we regard the relation to the other six party powers, um, we could say it's a power issue. And so my question is, how can we restore this trust on this familiar level, but also with the US and Russia and China and uh, Japan, which backs back to a very old history. And um, the, yeah, um, I wanted to add something, but I, waiting for your response. <laughs> I, that's a, really a, an excellent distinction you're making because to some degree, this should be a, an issue of, of Korea. I mean, Korea has the most to lose. Both North and South Korea are in the uh, battle zone and the numbers of the millions of people who potentially could die in a conflict, most of them would be Koreans. So to take this out of the hands of Koreans to decide this, and particularly the South Koreans at this point, because they're a junior partner in this discussion, I think is one of the things that's most distressing about this situation. And the idea that we can somehow uh, uh, decree that North Korea is not a nuclear weapons state when it clearly is a nuclear weapons state, uh, it's just not facing reality. Um, so. People might wish it were not so. I certainly wish it's not, it was not so, but the, the idea of trying to uh, disarm North Korea by any means, which seems to be what the, the American administration is implying right now, um, is pretty sinister, and particularly if you're a Korean. So I, I agree with you. This really ought to, the weight of the decision on this really ought to be more with the Koreans and the people who would suffer the most if, if something went wrong here. Thank you. I actually found the second part of the question again. Um, because I have the impression when we're talking about restoring trust, we always discuss about sanctions or getting back to the negotiation table or sanctions. And I was wondering, can we actually develop trust when we put sanctions on North Korea, a, a part of the world that is facing two thirds of the population um, in hunger and famine, mm -hmm. and also how we can restore the negotiation, but that's also part of the solution because North Korea is getting closer to the point where it doesn't have anything to lose and nuclear weapons are the only credibility tool they have. I, I think that if tomorrow we lifted the sanctions on North Korea, um, North, Korea the, North Korea would be very happy and continue with the development of the nuclear weapons program and the ballistic missiles programs, uh, because it's a goal uh, and it's a set goal and I don't see why they would change course now. Uh, there is no incentive. So that's one thing. Then two points regarding trust. First, um, regarding trust between North Korea and let's say the international community. Um, trust has been badly damaged between North Korea and China um, there is absolutely deep distrust that, in my opinion, nothing can change uh, between the U.S. and North Korea. And I'll just say two things negative about North Korea. First, um, it's in a book by Zhang Jingsong, who was a former United Front worker in North Korea, uh, who exited the country and then fled through China. Um, and he quotes Kim Jong-il, who defined diplomacy as a counterintelligence uh, exercise. Uh, it defines diplomacy as basically concealment and deception, um, not as an exercise of building trust, but an exercise as hiding your intentions and, um, and, uh, and making sure that the enemy does not know about your real intentions and real capacities. And it's really a quote uh, about uh, from Kim Jong-il. And the second one is the choice of the special envoys uh, by the North Koreans to the closing ceremony at the Olympics uh, in Pyeongchang, uh, actually, who was uh, a general, General Ri Yong-chol, uh, who was in charge of uh, organizing the operations, the shelling of Yongpyong in 2010. 
um, it's also a, a very a very strong signal that you know this is not really about building trust. This is not a signal that um, North Korea is willing to restore a relationship with South Korea. Actually, based on trust, it's based on something else. It's based on a common interest, but I don't think it, it's trust. So for me, the trust issue is extremely important. It's extremely difficult to address with North Korea, but it's also a very important issue between, I would say, the US and China mostly, um, and then between other partners, and this is where the efforts should be concentrated at this stage, in my opinion. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Soyeon Kim, currently studying Peking University, but I'm from one of the PTS uh, country, which sandwiched by two stronger country, which is US and China. Uh, yeah, South Korea. <laughs> and that's right, like, I, if you like, look those like discussions or news, the opinions are all come out from US and China. We can't find any like um, important opinions from South Korea, which makes me really, really sad. I feel like we're teasing, teased by those stronger like countries, right? And I, I agree that it's really important to balance those two countries. But in my opinion, I think it's the South Korea who need to lead this problem issue. So my question is, how, how should Korea like lead this problem? Because reality, like US is pushing us, China is also pushing us. So it's really hard to make the balance between two strong country. So it is easy to say you need to balance the country, but we, I want to, we want to be the leader. And some of the Korean want to be like reunification, right? So how, how could this our big dream come true? Like, yeah. I mean, I wish I had the answer, but I think you're... Yeah, we're so sad. <laughs> I would just say that the efforts of your government currently in at using the Olympics as a forum got a lot of people's attention, and I would encourage your government to do more of that, and I would encourage all the people in South Korea to do that as well, and just make people aware that, hey, we're here, we are the ones who are potentially in danger if, the, if we go to war, and we don't want that to happen. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe some dramatic move, uh, if a march could take place to the demilitarized zone from the south, something really big, uh, a mass movement of South Koreans uh, might be noticed in the world stage right now, given all the focus on, on Korea. So, um, and I'd be happy to talk with you more, and. Uh, We'd be happy to help you as much as we can, <laughs> IPPNW. Uh, and you can look, look us up, IPPNW.org, <laughs> www. And uh, we would be happy. I want to talk to you afterwards, and we want to help. Thanks. Hi, my name is Kai. I'm a senior at Tufts University. I'm part of the EPIC Colloquium. My question is uh, for Mr. Johnson. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, the North Korea dilemma in particular. This evening, but I want to shift the discussion a little bit um, in scope um, to the general existence of nuclear weapons um, as sort of a, as a nuclear weapons as a strategy. Um, I myself, I'm Japanese, so this is a this is a very sort of personal uh, topic to me. Um, President Obama, he made his famous speech um, in Prague, and he came, he made a very symbolic visit to Hiroshima. Um, in his last years uh, of his presidency. Um, while it's, uh, those are very sort of hopeful signs, um, part of me is a bit pessimistic that those were uh, promises that he maybe couldn't quite keep. Um, what do you think, sort of in, 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 a, in, a, in a long term, in a very sort of large time scale, what are the biggest obstacles um, that the, not just the United States, I would say principally the United States, because any sort of effort toward um, the abolition of nuclear weapons is really going to have to involve the United States, but also other nuclear actors. What, what, are, what are the main um, obstacles um, that stand in the way of the abolition of these horrible weapons? Um, is it political will? Is it uh, geopolitics, a combination of the two? I'd like your opinion on that. Thank you. Well, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it, that's going to be the ultimate question. If, if we're successful in getting uh, the nuclear ban treaty passed, the nuclear weapon states will still exist, and the motivations for them to disarm will not be uh, not much different than they currently are. There will be some additional uh, stigma, uh, you know, stigma placed on nuclear weapons, and using them would be even more... Uh, uh, re, you know, there'd be more revulsion if anyone actually used them. But uh, getting the United States to, I mean, our, our economy is, is uh, related to our military uh, industrial complex, something that Eisenhower, a former general, warned us about as he was leaving office. He, was, he could see it start to happen at that point. So part of this is an economic problem. It's not just in the United States. It is in a lot of these countries that have developed these systems. People have jobs, people have careers, people, I mean, what's the reason for the United Kingdom to still have a nuclear arsenal? It's very expensive, but it's, it's also an industry, and it's also a, um, a sense of, of feeling like they're a major power, and certainly that's true of Russia, you know, it's something that distinguishes Russia as being uh, not just another uh, country that, that's, you know, reliant on oil uh, and, and extractive industries. Um, so in terms of getting the United States, I mean, we're, we're having trouble getting our, our Congress to really do much of anything other than pass a tax break for wealthy people, you know. So uh, we're a long way away from, from getting there. But the thing is, the popular will at some point hopefully will bubble forward, um, especially if the rest of the world decides that these are unacceptable weapons that we have to have to get rid of. And, and then it'll be up to us to figure out how we do it using our own inimitable democratic processes here. And in conjunction with the rest of the nuclear weapon states, of course, unilaterally disarming will never occur with the United States. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Adams, Adamson would also answer this question. Our own inimitable democratic processes here. Thanks very much for that uh, question about um, nuclear disarmament and the obstacles to it. And I, I listened to um, Charles's comments as well. I think, uh, yes, uh, it's a mixture of political will. Um, it's about collective security, about how the regions uh, view each other. So Pakistan and India thinking that... Um, this is an existential issue for them. Uh, if you don't have uh, this weapon, if I don't have this weapon, you may wipe me off the face of the earth. So it's a kind of parity in that. I think there are also um, technological obstacles to the elimination of nuclear weapons. So, uh, in fact, the UK and Norway um, started a quite interesting project together. Norway being a non-nuclear weapon state, which was to see how would you verify nuclear disarmament, and how would those who are not inside the sort of nuclear weapons club, if you want to call it that, how would they be sure that if you said you were disarming, you actually did it? So um, there are some um, sort of building blocks, I would call them, on the way to, to uh, complete elimination, uh, which is all about, you know, how can you trust that if you sign up to a treaty that you have actually um, uh, implemented what you said you would? Uh, but on the um, political will, clearly when the U.S. and Russia um, have been more uh, inclined to talk to each other and come up with strategic reductions, then other nuclear weapons states do uh, tend to get behind that and look at uh, the number of um, nuclear weapons, for example, um, that, um, that they contain in their arsenal uh, and start to do more on things like verification. But I think that impulse does tend to come normally from Russia and the US, given that they have the preponderance uh, of, the, of the nuclear arsenal in the world. So where we are right now, quite interesting sort of shadow boxing rhetoric coming out of, you know, if you look at the nuclear posture review versus Putin then with a map of missiles landing on Florida, um, a sort of, you know, very a rhetorical uh, war. And it's hard to know whether this is uh, indeed um, sort of, signaling to each other, well, actually, I'm doing this because uh, I say I want to match you, but it is a prelude to going into another round of um, disarmament. And that's certainly what we would hope. Um, but there's always the risk of miscalculation when people start doing that. Um, but I would say in the, as far as the, the UK goes, I say, I'm speaking in my personal capacity here, but 
on the UK, it's very interesting that even when we were in the midst of quite a sort of disarmament phase running up to the 2010 NPT review cycle, uh, and when people were asked about the renewal of the Trident and the modernization of the Trident um, uh, boats, submarines, still uh, there was not a groundswell of public opinion in the UK uh, saying uh, we want we, we want disarmament. I say that because the MPs who were voting, I was quite surprised that still there was a mass of MPs who were voting for the renewal of the um, the Trident uh, arsenal. And I think it's very much the same as in the US, where sometimes Democrats can be painted as weak on security. You saw this extraordinary debate in the UK where people from the Labour Party, who I thought would be uh, more sort of pro-disarmament, actually were voting a certain way. Now, it may be, uh, from what Charles said, it's about you know, where is their constituency, who are the people who work there. But I think there's still that is a factor in public opinions in the UK and in France, I would add. Um, there is not, since the 1970s and 80s, we have not had that really sort of big debate uh, that certainly I knew when I was a teenager, it was all about the nuclear deterrent. Um, it's just, it's not been there uh, in, the, in the public discourse, not to the degree I would have expected. Thank you. With this, we come to the end of today's panel. I would like to thank all of the panelists and everyone who showed up in this terrible, terrible weather. The symposium will resume tomorrow at 10 a.m. in the ASEAN Auditorium of the Fletcher School. And the panel will be a loss of faith, the rise of populism and nationalism. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you out there. We also have our specialized breakout sessions from 4.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. tomorrow. And please do come for that too. With that, thank you again for our panelists and for everyone who's here. Thank you so much. Thank you.